Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. He's called Other Higher Powers. My name's Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, my name's Tracy, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. I've taken notes. Um, I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, when I was asked to speak about the other high powers, I freaked out a little bit because um, I gave my power away to everything. So I thought I'd make a list of all the things that I gave my power away to, and, and I gave them a status of higher power. Fear, denial, inaction, procrastination, every boss I ever had, the radio station I was working for, and the media, my husband, uh, codependency. So when I started my drinking career, I was about 11. I think I had my first drink when I was about, oh, I don't know, before five. My dad gave me a shandy. And um, that didn't come up until I was doing my 12 steps, and I'd actually forgotten that. Um, But I started drinking in earnest at about 11, and uh, I did that for 30 years. And I thought I had a problem, but at the time that I realised I had a problem, I didn't think I could ever deal with my problem. And... By that point, I was uh, a media personality. I used that term with my tongue wedged firmly in my, te- in my cheek because um, it's such a ridiculous term. But part of my job was being at functions and there was an unlimited supply of alcohol. And interestingly, um, my industry is one of the few industries in the world where you actually get given a drink just for turning up to work. So not first thing in the morning in radio, but in the entertainment industry. And it's considered normal. You turn up, someone gives you a drink. So that was interesting that I went into a career where alcohol was a huge part of that industry. Um, I did a lot of personal development before I stopped drinking because I thought I could control it myself. And I thought I could control it by doing all my metaphysical work. And to a certain extent, that it really, really helped me. But I kept drinking. And upon reflection, I, I was really in that state of will, that place of I can do this myself. And I was also really frightened to ask for help. I'd heard of AA, but I didn't know anyone who was a member. And because part of my role in the media was I had a segment on the radio show I was working in, and um, it was about slagging off the celebrities. I'm really ashamed to say that now, but that's what it was. It was horrible. And I knew the names of celebrities who were in fellowship. And I, I used to worry about that, thinking, if I know that this person's been to AA, then if I go to AA, then someone will put it in the paper. My industry is a pretty um, cutthroat industry, and so I gave my power away to the media. I was too scared to go to AA because I was too scared about what the media would write about me if I went to a meeting. I saw it as a really shameful thing. I saw it as something to be really, um, something to be hidden. I now understand clearly that if I had, if I had gone earlier, my life would have been different. However, everything happens the way it's supposed to happen and I came into recovery very much through the back door but I stand before you completely clean and sober today. So I didn't go to AA. What happened for me was I was um, interviewing a celebrity. I'd done my research on her. I knew that she was uh, a non-drinker. And most of us alcoholics are fascinated with people who don't drink, particularly celebrities. We want to know how they did it. We feel an affinity. We know that person. That person doesn't drink. They're my mate. We're so full of it. The point is, anyone who drinks and can't control it, they're, they're really sick. And we're all really sick. We're all just in different stages of recovery. So I interviewed this particular woman. 
I asked her in our interview, which was pre-recorded, about her uh, lack of alcohol in her life, and she started using the S word. Oh yeah, I'm sober, she said. Now, only alcohols use, alcoholics use the word sober in, in my um, experience. It's not a word that comes into um, everyday vernacular. And when I, I said, well, what does that mean? And she said, oh, well, I'm alcoholic. And I had a visceral response when she looked me in the eye and said, I'm alcoholic. Even saying it now, the hairs on the back of my neck have stood up because I knew that that's who I was. And I was filled with uh, recognition and also at the same time total terror because I didn't know how I was going to deal with it because I had this massive profile on this massive radio station and I didn't know who to ask for help. I just didn't know what to do. So I gave my power away to the radio station when really what I needed to do was pray. But I'd been brought up an agnostic and I didn't know how to do that. So I thought, well, I can control this. And it took me another three months. And in that time, I did some controlled drinking. I did another liver cleanse. I would stop drinking for three weeks at a time. And my body was a temple. Nothing would go into it. It was just all organic. It was all everything wonderful. And the minute that three weeks was up, I'd binge. And one of the worst things that happened to me in my drinking career, towards the end of it, and what I was discovering about our, um, addiction, because I actually work in this field in my, in my career now, is that when we know we're going to actually have to deal with something, we binge towards the end of that. We'll go, I'm just going to have a last hurrah. So I'm going to stop. We'll write ourselves off. And I was in Byron Bay. I went to a party, well, a dinner party at a girlfriend's place. We were drinking, we were smoking cigarettes, we were smoking pot. My little boy was in the next room playing. And we, we walked home, and I remember him saying to me, Mummy, you're frightening me. Because I was swaying all over the street. I was banging into him and his father. He was seven. And I woke up um, several hours later. Um, to use AA parlance, I was banging and crashing. I was banging into the walls. I didn't know where I was. I was covered in my own vomit. And my husband, who's no longer my husband, he was so loving and gentle, and he never, ever said a word about it, but he very quietly put me in the shower, stripped the bed, and put me back to bed. The next morning, I just woke up with this shame, because we all know that shame is the greatest emotion as an alcoholic, that we live with shame every day when we're drinking. It's the most horrible, pervasive emotion. It's like a cancer. Shame eats away at us and it stops us living our lives. And I remember thinking, that's it, I'm done. I'm done. But I wasn't done. I kept trying to stop. And on Christmas Eve, we went out for a part, to a party and it was on someone's boat on the Yarra because I was in that lifestyle where I hung out with celebrities. Interesting, I don't hang out with any of them now because I know who my real friends are. But I just drank myself into oblivion. And when I woke up the next day, my husband said to me, how are you? I said, yeah, I'm great. And I couldn't climb over this hangover in my head. And he said to me, you had a little bit too much to do last night. And it was the first time he'd ever, he'd ever said that to me. And something just snapped. And so I decided that day that I would stop. And I had three glasses of wine. I would have three glasses and that would be it. And I nursed them all day. And at the end of the day, when everyone had gone home, I said to him, and the irony of this statement, it's just, it's just so ridiculous, I said to him, would you roll me a joint because I've got something really important to tell you. <laughs> so I took a big, big puff of that joint and I said, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and you're codependent and I'm just dragging you down the road with me. And I, he said to me, I'm not stopping which, you know, for hindsight, and my expectation was that he would say, what can I do to help you? But he panicked too and just went, oh, I don't want to stop. And I said, this is not about you. It's all about me <laughs> for a change. And I said, look, what I need from you is to stop offering me alcohol. 
never make a joke out of it. Never, ever belittle me for this, but this is who I am. So I stopped drinking, but I swapped the witch for the bitch, and I smoked pot every single day, pretty much, until 12 months ago. Now, I've been nine years off alcohol. And in that time, what I have to say to you is, the higher power thing was something I just couldn't grasp. I'd stopped drinking for five years, and then I fell into an eating disorder. Now, the blessing of the eating disorder was that it took me into a fellowship, the 12-step fellowship, where I had to deal with my compulsive eating. And I did my first three steps. It completely changed my life, but I was so terrified. I can't even read the steps over there, but the step four, where we do our inventory, I just freaked out. I just thought I was the worst person in the world, and I couldn't possibly share the horrors of my past with someone I hardly knew because I'm a celebrity. What a wanker. I mean, seriously, if somebody in that fellowship said to me one day, if only you could get over being who you are. I said, I'm completely over who I am. I'm in this group. But the point is, upon reflection, it was that stepping stone into recovery that brought me here. And it takes a long time. And most of us alcoholics, we give our power power away to all these other things because we, we, we think we can control it and we can't. And I also understand from my experience with fellowship is that alcohol is generally the first thing we stop doing. And then we realise that we can't get through the day without 25 or 50 or 70 cigarettes. But I'm sober. Or we start smoking pot, or we fall into eating addictions, or we start gambling, or we become sex or love addicts. Because we're not actually dealing with the problem. The problem is less about the substance and more about our will. And that step of handing our lives and our will over to the care of God as we understood God, wow, that was a big one for me. That was huge. Just couldn't handle that one. What do you mean, hand it over to something else, something bigger than me? I'm pretty big. Pretty hard to find something bigger than me. So I did my first three steps with a food fellowship, and then I thought, I'm so well, I can deal with anything. So I left my husband for a gay man that I've never kissed. (laughs) And I've just realised this is being recorded. So, (laughs) So let's just bring up the A word, anonymity because I have a family. Um, but I started smoking like a train. I was eating cigarettes. I just I couldn't, couldn't stop. I was just pushing down every possible emotion. And um, am, I, am I there already? I think you're making that up. Well, Are you telling me I'm 10 or 20? <laughs> Nick, what are we doing? Where are we? Am I up to 20? Gee, I do this for a job and I've got no idea where I am. I'm getting close. Okay. The monkeys. Sorry, I think monkeys are good luck. I'm going to say banana. <laughs> <laughs> I'll confer with the, uh, okay. the adjudicators over here. Um, and you please continue to, okay. to let us know. So basically, I left home. I was in a situation where I couldn't stop smoking, couldn't stop smoking pot, didn't know what to do. And I just went to AA. I went with a friend who'd come back from overseas. I came into these rooms. I knew I was in the right place. Yeah, we do want to And AA has been my lifesaver because not only has it been somewhere where I could come and feel completely and utterly loved and supported and accepted, it's been the stepping stone for all the other recovery groups that I've um, dipped my toe into to find out what was wrong with me. So um, I went to NA because I was trying to get off pot, but that wasn't. I did an ID, so I just shouldn't mention the group. I apologise for that. Um, but then I went into a group to deal with love addiction. That was the most confronting thing I've ever done in my entire life, and I got off pot as part of that because I realised that that was something that was really um, holding me back. And then I went overseas on my own, which was something I'd never done, and I did a meeting pretty much every day when I was in LA and New York and that was extraordinary to know that I could be on the other side of the world and feel welcomed 
and there's that saying, never do anything unless if you're H A L T, if you're halt, hungry, anxious, lonely, or tired. I was all of that with that travel, but I went and I witnessed and I grew and I came home. Um, and then I came home and I did the Arch to Freedom program. And I mention that because it's the original program, the way Bill W and um, Dr Bob set it up. And it runs here in Melbourne, and um, it's doing the 12 steps in six weeks. In the States, they do it in four. I thought I couldn't do it. It brought up so much fear and pain. I had physical pain. I had chest infections. I had neck infections. I'm sorry, I'm neck infections, but I just, I was immobilized because I was so frightened of doing my inventory. And I did it, and I made my amends. And I stand before you to say that today I'm completely and utterly sober. I'm completely clean. I'm free of all of my addictions. I'm in recovery from everything. I am so grateful. And every single day that I get up, I understand that it's not the substance, it's the lack of spirituality in my life that was making me so unhappy. So I now know that my higher power is in me. It's not something outside of me. It's part of who I am. It's part of how I live my life. And today, today, and this is from the big book, once we've taken this step with holding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We feel we are on the broad highway of life, hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I gave my power away to all these other higher powers. And in the end, the simplicity was in the 12 steps and in this fellowship and in the anonymity of this fellowship. It doesn't matter who we are or where we come from. We're all the same in these rooms. And the greatest gift I have is reading those books, doing my journaling, doing my prayer and meditation, reading that good yellow um, fly that's in my big book every day, doing a good turn, trying not to be found out doing that good turn. So I'm really grateful to be here today. Thank you very much for listening. My name's Malcolm. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, member of the deal, Sunday night. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, Anthony for asking me to speak. All the people who have put the uh, conference on this weekend. Um, it's a great, great conference, and um, everyone who's, who's spoken. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I've been coming to AA since kind of 2000, and I was sober for about eight years. You know, I picked up for kind of 18 months and, and now I'm kind of, you know, so for, you know, kind of two and a half kind of years now. And, um, you know, I guess I'll just tell you, you know, they asked me, you know, could you come and speak? And I thought they're going to want me to speak about something spiritual. And, you know, and Anthony said, no, no, we've heard you speak. We want to hear you talk about the other higher powers, you know, because you kind of got a bit more expertise in that than what you do with the spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just kind of like, well, you know, I'll just tell you, you know, my story and, and kind of, you know, what, you know, what it was like, what happened, and, and what it's like now for me. And, um, you know, look, I, look, I wasn't as ambitious as the previous speaker. I first picked up when I was 12, not 11. Um, but, uh, you know, it was just, it was amazing. You know, when I first picked up, um, you know, all the anxiety, the fear, the, um, you know, self-obsession, the, the the concern about what you thought of me, the you know, it just dissipated and I just felt great, you know, and, and I, I passed out, uh, blacked out, um, you know, I vomited everywhere and I just thought, this is for me. And um, you know and anyway, uh, anyway I, I started drinking full time when I was about fifteen. Um, I, I moved from the country, a place called Dubbo in rural New South Wales where the men and men and the sheep are nervous. And I moved down to the city and I moved to Sydney and I moved to the eastern suburbs of Sydney. And it was just game on, you know. I just thought, this is just like shooting fish in a barrel. And, um, you know, I, I drank at a lot of pubs. I got introduced to, you know, we're talking, let's, let's be honest, we're talking about the other higher powers, right? Property, prestige, power and sex, you know. So, you know, let's, let's you know, I can't really... <laughs> 
out there. Um, and, you know, look, I, I started going to strip joints at, at, at you know, kind of 16, and, um, you know, I started using amphetamines and things at, you know, 16, 17, and, um, you know, I going to King's Cross was just, you know, a good night out kind of thing. And, and, you know, by the time I was 17, you know, I knew all the bouncers at all the night, all the strip joints in King's Cross, um, and they knew me because I was a habitual visitor, you know, I was in and out, you know, and, 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 and I don't know what it is, just seeing a beautiful girl naked, just, you know, I thought that was a lot of fun. And, you know, but they could see I wasn't going in there for fun, you know, I, I, I was going in there with a purpose, you know, and uh, I, I was going in there to make me feel better, you know, and, um, you know, I drunk and, and I used a lot of drugs and, and, and I went to a lot of places like that and... And, you know, by the time I was 19, you know, I was kind of at the top of my game, you know, I was going to a lot of celebrity parties, I was, you know, more circuses and people on trapeze and, you know, I was, you know, kissing, you know, movie stars and, you know, I just thought, you know, as it says in the book, I had arrived, you know, I remember being in this nightclub one night just going, God, I feel good. You know, and, 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 and all my life I, I, I wanted to feel like that because, in between drinks, I didn't feel that good, you know. Like, I, I felt really, really bad. And I, I didn't feel that I, you know, I, I didn't fit in. And, 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 you know, I felt really anxious around you. I didn't feel comfortable. And, and, and what I drank, I did. Anyway, uh, you know, I was a, bar, I was a bartender. And, and, you know, my, my uh, you know, expenditure was exceeding my income. So I came up with this great idea. You know, my, my solutions are always getting into me, getting me into a lot more trouble than my problems, you know. So I started selling this, um, you know, these glucose, this, this cocaine, right? You know, at 2 o'clock in the morning in a nightclub, who knows what you're buying, you know. And um, anyway, about kind of four or five months into this, some really bad people did figure it out. And um, they kind of said that, you know, they were going to do some really bad things to me. So... Uh, to resolve that situation, like any good alcoholic, I just went to Byron Bay and moved to Byron Bay for a couple of years and uh, got really stoned and really messed up up there. Came back to Sydney um, and, and you know, I came back to Sydney and I, I stopped using drugs and things and I just started. My drinking just took on a, a level of heaviness to it that it never had before. You know, I was always a fun guy, you know, you know let's, you know, let's take our clothes off, let's have a bit of fun, you know. And um, anyway, you know, I, 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 it, it started getting quite violent as well. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I was getting beaten up by bouncers a lot. I was, you know, getting thrown through plate glass windows. The cops were arresting me. You know, I remember I'm getting thrown through this. Uh, this is another plate glass window, and I go, "You can't do this. I'm in a suit." And you know, <laughs> straight through this window, and you know. And, and, you know, because I, I, I'd kind of gotten a, a job of selling these um, tech stock bloody things. I don't know what I'm doing, you know. Just yeah, 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 bye, bye, bye. And, and you know, and um, anyway, I, you know, I was drinking every day. You know, so I'm an everyday drinker. Um, you know, I'm using other substances. And anyway, um, you know, I got done for drink driving by the police. I got, you know... Resisting arrest. I was trying to, I had a disagreement with this guy in the kebab shop and I was trying to reverse my car into the kebab shop and, you know, that stuff doesn't go down that well. And, you know, so, you know, I, look, I'm just trying to illustrate that I was pretty messy, you know, like I was just, I was a messy drunk and, 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 you know, um, I got beaten up by this, you know, the guys I've heard, I got beaten up by this, you know, transvestite, this big black African American transvestite. I was trying to get to the taxi club, right, in, in Sydney, which is a pretty low bottom place and and you know, she wouldn't let me in and I'm gonna fight with her and you know, she she's, you know, smacking me a couple of times in the head and you know, regrouping. And uh and she said, you know, I told you last week, you're an alcoholic whack and you know she, she, you know, and I'm like, you know, how dare she beat me up and furthermore, how dare she tell me I'm an alcoholic, you know? Anyway, you know, that drove me into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I come from an alcoholic family. You know, my, my father, my grandmother, it's ravaged her. And I never wanted to be an alcoholic, you know. And I promised myself I was never going to be an alcoholic. 
and through all my will and determination, I became an alcoholic. And anyway, I got to the point where I'm like, I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to go to a, a, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, you know, I put a suit and tie on and I went down to AA and, 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 and you know, I said, would you please have me? And they said, yeah, it'd be great to see you next week. You know, I just thought, fantastic. Anyway, I got sober, went back to uni and my life took off. I got, got a really big job down here in, in Melbourne, you know, I'm paying a really good coin. I started selling and trading and flipping real estate and, you know, doing all types of things. And, and you know, by the time I'm 26, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I've got kind of, you know, I've got kind of half a dozen houses, I'm doing pretty good, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm rocking out, you know, I'm like, if this is sobriety, yeah, I'm all for this, you know, and, um, what I kind of said to God is, if you could take the drinking, I'll look after everything else, okay? Take away the drinking and the drug use and, and, and remove that from me, and I'll look after the rest. And anyway, you know, God did that for me. And, uh, you know, I'm going to my groups and I'm doing... But I, I started to get really, really focused on making money, you know? And, and that started to become the paramount focus for me. You know, I was going to... My, my group, you know, once a week, I was doing bare minimal, you know, I was talking to my sponsor, you know, and anyway, I got involved in some business dealings with some guys that my sponsor at the time said, don't get involved with those guys, they're bad guys, you know, and anyway, we started doing a whole lot of deals, and to cut it, you know, long story short, um, you know, we got to the point where we had this company that was worth about $25 million, and then... The GFC came along, and those guys said, look, we want the money back. And I'm like, well, what do you mean exactly? And they said, well, we want the money back. And, and, and I'm like, well, uh, I can't pay it. And they're like, well, you've got a couple of options. You know, you either sign the company over to us, or we come around and, uh, and knock on your door, and you never come home. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so I considered those two options, spoke to my sponsor, my sponsor said, you've got to get out of that situation. You know, that's a bad, bad situation. And, you know, at this stage, I'm six years sober. You know, like, it's not like I'm sober for five minutes, and, but I'm managing my life. You know, I'm running the show. And anyway, uh, so, you know, I signed the company over, met up with a friend, and, you know, what do you do at a tough time? You know, you, you, you go to a strip joint, you know. And, you know, I'm sitting in the strip joint and, you know, I'm there with these two beautiful girls and, you know, I'm feeling sorry for myself. But, you know what, you know, it's not going that well, you know, sobriety's not really working out for me. I might as well just have a drink, you know. And so, you know, I had a drink. And uh, then I had some lines. And then, you know, I had a few more girls. And, and, and you know what, I'm the best part of eight years sober. I've just lost a company. I, I got married somewhere along that line to an amazing woman. You know, and, uh, you know, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm drinking again. You know, I'm like, what? what? What's going on? So, you know, I've got a solution. I know what we'll do. We'll go to Dubai. So, I get this job and we go to Dubai, right? And, you know, in the job interview, they're like, have you ever built skyscrapers? Yeah, yeah, you know, a Rika Tower in Melbourne? Yeah, I was involved in that. Um, and so, next thing we're in Dubai. You know, and, and my sponsor's like, what the hell are you doing? Don't go. Don't. No, 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 no. You don't understand. And, uh, you know, you don't understand. You know, I've got to do it my way. You know, so I'm in Dubai. Oh, yeah, I lived in London in between there somewhere. And anyway, um, I'm in Dubai and, you know, it, it's a Muslim country. You know, you're not really allowed to drink that much. Anyway, you know, it just happens. I, I team up with these Russian guys who used to be ex KGB and they've got this big house and they've got heaps of coke and heaps of Russian, you know, girls. And, 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 <laughs> like, it's, it's just, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I just kind of grab, I don't mean to, but I just kind of find that stuff pretty easily. And anyway, so, um, you know, I'm in Dubai for 18 months, I'm with these Russian guys and, you know, I'm up to my neck. Um, and the GFC comes along, I get made redundant. You know, I got this, you know, Range Rover bloody sport, I've got all this debt. Um, and my wife's like, what are we going to do? We'll leave the car at the airport, we'll get on the plane, and we'll get the hell out of here. Sounds like a pretty good idea. Um, so, you know, I'm out of there. We stopped, we came through Hong Kong, Singapore, back to Australia. 
And that took us probably two weeks, and I was not sober for a minute. You know, I wasn't sober for a minute, and I was just trying to push all this pain and all this, all these unresolved things that I wasn't willing to let God take. I was just trying to push them down and get it. And we landed in Australia, and my wife, God bless her, she just said, Baby, I love you. You've got to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. You're killing yourself. You know, you're killing yourself. And, you know, the whole time I'm just, man, I'm so irritable, restless, and discontent. You know, I can't sit still. Anyway, you know, we make this decision. The only place I've felt, you know, comfortable is in my group, you know. The deal on a Sunday night, you know, I feel safe there. I feel accepted there. I feel it's okay, and I'm okay, just who I am. So anyway, we, we decide to come back to Melbourne, and, and, you know, I've been sober ever since, and, and, and my sponsor asked me to do something that I wasn't willing to do before, and that was put everything on the table. Put your life on the table. Give it to God. Give Him everything. Because, you know, when you manage it, it's being managed by an idiot, you know? And, uh, I'm like, yeah, right, okay. Um, so there was a huge amount of ego that I had to let go of. There was a huge amount of humility that I had to accept. And, you know, what I guess from my, you know, small experience with, you know, those other things that I've tried to use to fix me, is it wasn't until I completely surrendered, you know, and I really put everything on the table and I said, you know, God, you take it. You run it, I'll do whatever you want. You know, today, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Joe Average, you know. My, my sponsor calls me, he says, how you going, Joe Average? How's Joe Lunchbox? You know, I got a, I got a really, uh, I got a pretty average job. I work for really wealthy bodyguards, so annoying, but anyway. I, I got a, I got a pretty, you know, average house in the suburbs. I, I got a wonderful wife. I got a beautiful little girl. And you know what? I've never been wealthier in my life. You know, and, and, you know, I, I couldn't explain that to me, you know, five years ago. I had to go through what I had to go through, and I hope you don't have to go through the kind of pain and the, and the you know, obsession about other higher powers that I had to go through. But they're the things that I, I, I went through to get to where I am today. And, you know, I really can tell you today I like who I am, and, and I'm, I'm okay just as, as I am, you know. And the kind of car I drive and my bank balance and the suburb that I live in, they don't define who I am. They don't define my worth today. You know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who's, who's worthwhile, lovable, and acceptable to me. And, you know, I'm just so grateful for that because, you know, that's, uh, that, that's the difference between heaven and hell from where I've come from. So thanks for letting me share and, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Gail, I'm an alcoholic. Um, thanks for asking me to share uh, today on this topic. And I've got to say, it was pretty funny being asked to share on this topic because someone was saying to me that, uh, they were saying to me, Gail, why was there a resounding um, woohoo when we said we were going to get you to share? What is it I don't know about you? And I was like, I'll tell you later, Nick, and I'll probably tell you from the floor because I tend not to talk in generality. Um, yeah, my only higher power before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous was alcohol. And um, and all that went with it, I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic. But um, after I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I got here and, uh, you know, I had no solution to the way I felt. You know, the grog for me was um, the full stop at the end of my sentence and I would start talking and talk, talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and then I would drink and then I could take a breath and it would all be okay. And when I got sober, I started to wind up and wind up and wind up and there was no full stop at the end of my sentence and I felt like I was going to explode. And um, at 60 days sober, I found someone and I asked them to take me through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and she was Scottish, I couldn't understand what she said um, and uh, she had this Scottish husband who used to just look at me every time I turned up at the house and go, oh, for fuck's sake, because I was always crying. I couldn't stop crying. And um, she took me through the program. And I was terrified it wasn't going to work for me. Um, but, uh, you know, we went through the book from, from the prefaces and we got to the bit where it talks about um, 
you know, uh, we go home, we, we do our good step, we go home, and we pull the book down from our shelf, and um, we, you know, consider what we've just done. So, and But I didn't have a shelf. And before I went to share my good step, I was so terrified that this wasn't going to work for me that I had said to my husband, you need to build me a shelf, because if I don't have a shelf, it might not work. And, and he said to me, I'm going to ring your sponsor and I'm going to ask her if you really need a shelf. <laughs> if you don't really need a shelf, I'm pretty sure you're going to be okay. And, um, you know, he pulled the, he rang my sponsor and he got back to me on that matter. And he said to me that the sponsor says that if you pull the book out from under your bed, it will still work. <laughs> and um, I did pull the book out from under my bed, I got home, and, uh, you know, I did six and seven. And, you know, six and seven for me is where this work is at. Um, six and seven is where all the work is at, actually. Is, which I think it's ironic that so the time spent on it in, in, um, in the big book. But, um, you know, what had happened for me was rather than um, becoming willing to have God remove my character defects and then humbly ask him to do so, which I did do in that moment because I was genuinely beaten at that moment. But my ego has incredible, um, you know, recovery. And as soon as I did those steps, I thought I had an excellent idea. And my excellent idea was that I should get married to my boyfriend. And um, that given my sponsor had said to me not to make any big decisions to be halfway through the ninth step, I told my boyfriend that this was an excellent idea. He obviously went on with, along with it because we did it. Um, and I planned my trip back to Australia to do my amends and um, we... The 16 direct events had the list, and at 10, at number 10, I could get married. So I left England, came to Australia. I did, like, I think I did eight of the 16 direct events until and when I really lost the plot and found myself at this meeting, like, hysterical. And, um, and talked to an older sober member who told me that, um, you know, I was running the show and that, you know, maybe I should just relax which is into a course. And um, so I went ahead and tried to do the rest of the amends and, you know, got married. And, um, you know, that for me was really the story of, um, you know, me trying to keep God out of my life. And ultimately, um, when I'm trying to keep God out of my life, it's not allowing God into my life. And ultimately, this is where I have my problems in Alcoholics Anonymous and where I have my problems in my sobriety, is that, um, you know... I can't, I, you know, I wanted to uh, continue to compartmentalise my life. So God can go after the alcohol and I'll take care of this over here. And I knew how I wanted my life to look and I knew what would make me happy. And what would make me happy was getting married to someone who was smart and um, would earn good money and then we would live happily ever after in the house. And I, I think at that time I even considered having babies, which I'm glad I've heard that is And um, And that we would, um, and then we would, go on to a, a happy ending and I would never actually have enough feeling because I would just inventory my way out of any feelings because I now had a solution for the problem of life. And to me that was a great plan and um, it didn't work out at all. And before I knew it, I was doing stuff like cheating on my husband and um, I was... Uh, I was just doing crazy shit, and the crazy shit that I do nearly always ends up in me getting hurt, which is, you know, like, I've got a broken collarbone at the moment, and this is about me doing more crazy shit. So, um, you know, I went skiing with a ski instructor that I met in Aspen, and um, came back to Australia, and, and broke my back. And I came back to Australia, I fell off the, I fell off the back of Mount Hoffman, I broke my back, and I came back to Australia, I left my husband behind, I couldn't... Um, I couldn't sit or stand, I could only lie on my stomach. And um, I had to find a way to get in touch with this high power that I'd completely abandoned at the, um, at the outset. At the minute I started to feel good, the minute it was like I was off on So, um, you know, I slowed down for long enough for that and I started to feel better again. And, um, you know, I, I started to feel better and I got a job and I could stand and I could do all these other and, you know, and then some people said it to me and I ended up having surgery on my neck. And, you know, I went completely nuts in that. Um, I was seven years sober. I'd never been so unhappy. 
Um, God was playing a big part in my life, really. You know, like he, I was, I was showing up to meetings. I was, you know, I was doing the 12th step. I was sponsoring half the planet. I was, um, you know, I was in services. I always had been from the beginning of, you know, from the beginning of my sobriety. I was in service. I was doing all of the right stuff, but I had no real. I was still running my own show, you know, like I was still running around trying to make myself feel better by going, there's no need to look here, there's nothing to see here, people, I'm just going to be straight here and we're going to pass. And, um, you know, and I was really slowed down. Once again, I found myself in a place where I needed, I needed to find um, a power greater than myself. That could restore me to sanity. And I was insane. Like, I was I was stuck on my couch. I'd had this major surgery. Um... I was in pain. I'd been in pain for like the, the nine months leading up to it. I was very, very weak. I couldn't look after myself at all. Um, I was living with a member who was looking after me. And, and up until that point, my way of meditating was running or, or, or doing something physical, and I could no longer do any of those things. So, you know, I got really powerless again. I found myself sitting in churches. You know, I, I, was, I was doing all of this stuff to try and make myself feel better. And, um, you know, and I ended up doing another big inventory and having a long time. And I started to feel a little better. You know, and I got the humility to show up in a job on a retail store, and, and, uh, which was, wasn't where I was prior to the injury. And, you know, things really took off for me from there. I, um, you know, every obsession with everything else that I've had, you know, men, sex, money, whatever it is, is it has been, has been, um, you know, it's just another excuse for an obsession. You know, I obsess about, you know, what I, the mistake I've made. I obsess about a guy who work. I obsess about, ultimately it's all, you know, once it shifts from that thing of just I like doing this into I'm completely obsessed with it. I can't think of anything else. It's just an excuse for me to think about myself. And once I realized that there was actually nothing wrong except what was wrong with me, and once I realized that every obsession was just an obsession with myself, and then I, you know, I, then I realized that actually there's nothing I can do about that. Because I can't, you know, it says very clear, clearly in the book, we can't wish our, our self-centeredness away by our own power. We had to have God's help. So, you know, I get to see this thing over and over again. I have to keep coming back to God. Because, you know, that self-centeredness that cripples me and, and separates me from um, my ability to participate in life, separates me from people, separate, you know, it separates me from others. My self-centeredness is so... Um, you know, you know, that's the thing that'll kill me. That's what it talks about in the book. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of the problem. That's the root of every single one of my problems. And it all comes back to that problem. It comes back to the fact that every single obsession I have is with myself. And it's often self-centered fear where I'm frightened of not getting what I want or I'm frightened of losing what I've got. But, you know, even in the, you know, in those great obsessions with, um, with men I've had over the years, every single one of them has been about what they think of me, really. You know, it's never been about, you know, what can I bring to this relationship? Not once. Well, maybe once or twice. But, um, you know, and, I, and, and, you know, and I have had that experience of having um, genuine love and care. I have had that experience where I've showed up in relationships in particular and um, being genuinely there to be the first person I can be in it. Um, and, uh, and that's been absolutely fantastic. It's like, you know, I... When my late partner, um, you know, I, I, I was with someone for quite a long time and we broke up and then he got sick and he came around to my house and he said to me, darling, you need to look after me because I'm sick. And I said, listen, you're the worst boyfriend I've ever had. I've just got you out of my house. You're not coming back in there. I was 10 years sober and the idea of him moving back in with me was not appealing at all. And he said to me, darling, I'm really sick. You need to look after me. He had lost some weight and I said to him, all right, you can come back in there. So he moved back in again, and as it turned out, he had um, liver cancer, which is terminal, which was terminal and inoperable. And so, um, you know, I got to decide to show up in that with him, and, you know, in that, I got to decide that, um, well, that, that I would be there through that with him. And so, therefore, I kind of went, well, you know what, I, I was single at the time, I'd been with him, and we weren't getting back together, but I went, you know what, I am with him, this is the deal. And it was absolutely fantastic. It didn't mean I didn't get laid, but it did, it did mean that I was committed to him. And, um, you know, and I showed up in that 18, uh, 15 months and found out that I was not the person who I thought I was. 
um, that it was actually much better. And I was only better because God was asking me to go. And, um, you know, uh, because because um, I went out of my mouth and because I did stuff I didn't want to do and because I dealt with things I didn't want to deal with and because I kind of let go of, you know, all of the things that I thought were going to make me happy in order to look after somebody else just, just once. And, um, you know, it was just, it was absolutely fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. And what happens for me now as well is, you know, I could just crack my collarbone because I was, once, you know, I just did the dignitary and my sponsor said to me, you need to have a quiet six months ago and get in touch with a high power. Like, I'm not this that. I'm 15 years old, but do I, st- do I really have to do this? So what I did was I got home and I made a whole lot of plans, including to go motorbike riding. And I got on the bike and I started going fast, and it's really, really good, so I started going faster. And because, you know, I think I'm Casey Stoner as soon as I get on the motorbike, and, you know, I'm not bad, but I'm not Casey. Well, I was, actually, as I flew over the top, because he does that a lot. But, um, I, you know, I, I started to do the exact opposite, because six and seven is hard. I don't want to do what I don't want to do. I don't want to do that shit. I want to do what I want to do, what I think makes me feel happy. And, but, you know, this is because I, and, and you know, like, the big ticket item for me, you know, my sponsor, my old sponsor used to say to me, Gay, you're the fish you've got to fry. And um, the, the thing for me is I've got to figure out what makes me happy because there's all this stuff that I think will make me happy and all of it's wrong. There's a whole lot of stuff that, um, I, and, and you know, my, the deal is I need to get honest with myself about what actually makes me happy. Working with others makes me happy. Showing up here makes me happy. Working service makes me happy to my person. But, you know, I still have these old ideas left over, and those old ideas drive me. And, you know, once I get rid of those old ideas, um, and, you know, that's often by breaking things with me, but anyway, um, you know, I've got a good, good chance to be happy in this world. So um, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. For Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.